with the second animation tutorial. Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, a couple different advanced animation techniques in Grasshopper uh, using two new two new tools. Uh, first of all, Centipede and also uh, Head Wrap Around. And so what we're going to be showing today is how to animate using multiple sliders, uh, a few different ways of controlling how objects look in the viewport for animation, and um, a little bit of camera control from within Grasshopper. Uh, so to start with, uh, this plugin Centipede is what we're going to be using for multiple slider control. And it's, it's got uh, two parts, but the one that we're going to be concerned with is this animation keyframe timeline. Um, and so basically what this component does is it replaces one of your existing sliders. Um, and there's a little bit of setup here that I'll go ahead and show you. So first of all, if we just go ahead and replace the connections for the slider, And that starts to get us set up. Um, you can see here that we have uh, starting values, ending values, uh, starting frames, ending frames, and a frame progress input over here. And so, so basically what those are is the uh, starting value and end value controls the movement range that you want to display. And so for the slider that I'm replacing, the movement goes from 3 to, to 6. And so I'm going to go ahead and just put in those values. Because I already previously set up my sliders to um, show the desired range uh, for this animation. So that's the start value and the end value. And then the start frame and the end frame controls the time period that you want the movement to happen over within your animation. So last time we did an animation that was 360 frames long. Um, so for this animation, <coughs> I'd like to, to have this uh, mezzanine height moving um, let's say starting at frame 180 and then that's going to go to frame 360 so that means that the uh, the mezzanine height change from, it'll start halfway through the animation at the lowest value for the mezzanine height and by the end of the animation it will uh, be at the highest value for the mezzanine height. Um, so those are, the, uh, those are the basic inputs right there and we've hooked it to our, to our controls and um, I'll do the same with this this uh, animation keyframe component down here that I previously set up, just replacing the rotate across number slider. So after we have the both of those, we can see that it still needs still needs a bit of input. Um, and so so the other piece that you need to put into these animation keyframes is the uh, the frame progress. And so that's basically the the master slider that's going to control your animation uh, since you can only animate from a, a single slider. And so if we plug in that slider to both of these animation keyframe timelines, um, we can see what our animation will look like. And then in this case, again, we're going to want to, just like we did last time, uh, take the slider down to zero, right click, go to animate, and set our, our options to export. Um, there's one other thing that I want to show you 
uh, here in this animation control um, <coughs> for this tutorial. And that is uh, the fact that you can use the size of your window to control the size of your, your animation. So for example, if I want to have you know really thin animation where the entire screen is taken up by uh, this tower, I can go ahead and move it down into something like that. It's going to be fairly small. And we can see that when I right click on the animate, um, and I click this button to set the, the animation resolution to the, the current viewport, that it'll give me exactly the bounds of what I see on the screen. And so it's kind of a useful thing for, for getting your animations uh, framed a little bit better. And so, yeah, you would just go ahead and click Animate and make that work. And so here is the animation that I created using that method that I just showed you with multiple sliders. So you can see that it's it's rotating, and at the same time, the, uh, the height between the sets of floors, the mezzanine height, is getting taller. Okay, so now that we know how to animate with multiple values, let's go ahead and turn this off. And I'll show you uh, that what we're doing next is we're going to use a new method for how this is displayed in the viewport. And so you can see that in this script, I've gone ahead and replaced um, all of the sliders that I wanted to animate with their own keyframe animation timelines. Uh, they've all got kind of different values that they're moving across, um, different times during the animation that they're going to be activated. And so that's going to create kind of a really variable animation where I can highlight several different things, how they work together in concert. <coughs> but the thing that I really want to show you on this next version of the script is uh, this handy little component from Heteroptera that's called Animation Capture. And so you're going to find that up here in the Heteroptera toolbar in the Animate uh, section. So Heteroptera has, you know, a bunch of useful components, but for now we're really concerned with how animation is output. And so we're going to use this component to capture uh, the geometry. <coughs> and so looking at it, you know, we can see that we've got, we've got an input that's the geometry to capture. Uh, and the nice thing about that is that it's really, you know, just whatever geometry you have, surfaces, B-reps, etc., um, can go in there. Uh, the second option is the colors as a list. If you wanted to find the color of the material, uh, some specific red or blue, or as a list for, you know, the different, um, the different geometries that you're using, then you can go ahead and input that there. Um, we have this activate capture switch, which uh, basically tells it whenever the the input geometry changes to to capture uh, what's in the viewport to a file that we define down here with a, a path. If I've set mine to C slash capture, uh, just by going ahead and going into <coughs> into set text here, you can see that I put it as C slash capture within the text box. Uh, we also need to set a, a file name. Um, my file name is, is just capture for this. And that file name is going to be um, numbered. So like the first one will be capture one, the second will be capture two, the third will be capture three, uh, and so on and so on. 
Um, last, you know, we need to set a an image type, a PNG, a bitmap, or a JPEG. I like Torque and PNG, so I've gone ahead and set that there to PNG. And uh, finally, we have a, a reset button for if we want to reset the, the file membrane. So if we've we've done you know a bunch of um, we've done a bunch of these capture files, um, and we want to restart, uh, that'll that'll bring the number back to zero as opposed to as opposed to continuing it along however many files we've already captured. Um, and so, so this exports those, uh, and I guess the, the really important thing about it is that it doesn't export, uh, it doesn't just take a, a snapshot of what you see here in the viewport, but it, it bakes your geometry temporarily to the viewport. So if I go ahead and turn off all of these, uh, geometries so that you can't see them anymore and then I bake them into the viewport um, I'm, this is what's going to display in the animation so I can go ahead I've got it in wireframe right now you can display it as shaded you know rendered ghosted any of the uh, any of the options you know some of you might want to go for a, a technical sort of sort of animation capture um, and so that gives you a little bit more option for for the display style of your animation. <clears throat> and when that is all set up, and we've gone ahead and turned our, our capture to true, um, we do the same as we would in any other any other sort of uh, animation method, where we just say animate, right click, set up all of our options here. Um, and so the little bit weird thing about this is that to, to do this method, we're going to be op outputting basically two sets of files. Uh, so a series of pings um, and a series of, of pings from the other component as well. Um, but we need the other component to bake the objects into right now. Uh, so for example, without that, you know, it won't bake. Um, and so, so I've already made an animation using that uh, that we can see in my folder for computational design. Well, actually it's in my capture folder because that's where I set it up to see capture. And so we can kind of see how this is this is working, where it's capturing different uh, files for every time I've I've output it. And so I'll go ahead and delete everything in there. That way, when I export, um, you know, we'll be we'll be good to go. Okay, and so what that looks like I basically I basically strung all my animations together over here. And so this uh, this animation that we're watching right now should there we go. It turns into... Uh, output from the component that I just showed you, which is baked uh, into the Rhino viewport and then exported from there. Uh, and so that's a that's a handy way to get a little bit more control over how your objects are displayed and how they're animated. And it's a little strange because you know you have to set it up and then you don't see anything on your your viewport while you're animating. But it's a it's a nice method to use. Um, Okay, so that's camera control. Go ahead and turn that off for a moment. And then we'll go into the last aspect that I wanted to show you, which is also using Heteroptera. And again, it's in the, the animation section, and it's camera control. Um, 
So the name of this uh, component is, I believe it's just camera, uh, camera crate. Um, and so, you know, you don't necessarily need to, to change your camera angles. You can do a lot with just kind of rotating the geometry within the window from a, a fixed perspective. Um, and so you should be definitely be careful about when you use this. But it can be useful for doing things like um, zooming in on a detail that you want to display or you know moving up and down to show views from the from the street to the top or doing like a flyover for example if you have a long building um, and so so this camera crane component um, takes a couple of inputs uh, first of all it takes the camera location uh, as a point value uh, second of all it takes the target location as a point value um, and then it also takes, you know, focal lengths for the lens, um, up direction, um, view name, if you have a, a specific viewport that you want to capture it in, uh, but if you don't set it, it'll just take it from the perspective viewport that we're in right now. Um, and last of all, there's a, there's a, a Boolean trigger for uh, turning on the component and making it work. And it does have, you know, all of these these inputs, um, but we're really not concerned with that right now because the the um, thing that we want to use this for is we want to hook it all back into this main animation slider, so that when you uh, change that slider, the view also changes, so that you can kind of animate. Um, animate your your parameters while you're animating your camera view and camera movement. Um, so the way that I like to kind of set up these these points, the, the camera location and the target location, is I like to uh, define a path for the camera and a path for the target and then use the evaluate cur curve component to um, move that over, you know, a specified range. And so, for these paths, I've defined, uh, defined a circle that is used for the, it's used for the, uh, the camera to go around, so the camera will move around it like that. Uh, and I've also defined a, a line that goes up and down the spine of the torso through the curve that can move my, <coughs> my focus from the base to the, to the top of this curve. So if I go ahead and turn these guys on, we can see the points as they move. Um, so I'll turn everything off so you guys can really see what's happening there. That is evaluating this. <coughs> okay. So out here is that circle uh, that we talked about, and there's a. Uh, I've defined it also, you know, not just to be a flat circle, but so that it can kind of move up and down as the animation progresses. And so we can see that this slider then controls uh, vertical movement of uh, the circle. Um, this slider controls the, the radius of the circle so that we can kind of zoom in and out on our, on our target. Um, and this slider controls where along the circle the camera is. And so we can see that if we could combine these things, you know, we can kind of do like some interesting sweeps where we where we rotate around and um, you know perhaps move from, from the ground to the top of the tower while 
uh, zooming in on a component. Um, so it allows for some, some pretty nice dynamic action during our animations. Um, and this parameter controls, you know, where along the core our focus is. So like, are we looking at the top of the building? Are we looking at the bottom of the building? Are we going somewhere in between? Um, and so the idea is that basically you would set up all of these and then uh, replace these with the replace these with the centipede um, component that we replaced the sliders with earlier uh, using your start value and value frame start your frame end and hooking it back to the original animation slider that controls everything uh, to kind of control it all at the same time. Uh, yeah, and then basically from there, you know, uh, same thing as we always do. After that's set up, let's right click, animate, um, export everything using our animation settings. Um, you know, again, since we're uh, since we have this animation capture, make sure that the toggle is set to true to capture changes to the Rhino geometry, and you know, make sure that your geometry is hidden uh, so that you're not displaying any of your your camera paths or your points or anything like that. And then we're good to go. Uh, and so those those three things the um, the ability to use multiple sliders uh, and animate them at different points throughout throughout your timeline, uh, the ability to get um, to get baked geometry into your your animation, and the ability to control the camera for dynamic movement. Uh, those three things are really going to help you to kind of make more more interesting animations, more appealing animations, and animations that are um, more directly focusing on the aspects uh, that you want to highlight in your building and in your presentation. Um, and so those are all good, and there's a few other things that I want to show you today on the uh, post-processing side in Photoshop. Um, so last time, you know, we showed you basically how to how to input your frames and how to um, how to input your frames and how to create an animation from those frames. Uh, so today, I do want to show you uh, just kind of a few quick things that you might want to do. Um, so a lot of people last time had these these really big canvases, kind of like the one I'm showing here. Uh, where the animation is not, um, you know, there's a lot of white space that's got to be kind of zoomed in and cropped in the browser. Uh, one of the things that you can do, though, after you've loaded all your frames in to Photoshop to create your animation, is that you can um, you can go up here to Image Canvas Size, and you can use this to crop. Um, crop your, your series of images in a number of different ways. And so, so this one right here is 808 by 808 pixels. Um, I'm going to crop it down to 400 by 800 pixels. And uh, we can see that this anchor control here is really important. So if I were to say, OK, with the anchor control in the center, obviously it's going to um, it's going to shrink everything towards the center. I lose uh, my animation, what I want to show in it. Um, so instead of doing that, really the way to go here is to set your values and to um, down here, we know our animation is on the left hand side, so if we click that, everything is going to move in towards the left. And so we're going to crop a little off the top, a little off the bottom. Uh, and a lot off the right hand side. Um, we can also, you know, use this lower left hand corner if we wanted to so that we just crop off the top and off the right hand side. So if we go ahead and say okay with that one, um, 
we can see that now we have a little bit better of a, an animation frame for what we're doing. Um, and the other thing that I'd like to show you here is this idea of, of how, you know, if you have two different alignments that aren't, aren't quite right and, you know, maybe your, your materiality or your colors are changing because you want to, um, you want to kind of show the transition of your work and the process of your work in this digital format, um, you're going to want to, to make that transition a little bit less, less harsh there. Um, so there's this, this thing down at the bottom that's called tweens animation frames. And so if I click on that after I've selected my, my two frames that I want to bridge between, um, we can see that it, it's going to basically add frames in between those. And so it's going to add those based on, um, these parameters of position op opacity and effects and it's basically gonna gonna take the the two frames and kind of layer them layer them over one another to make a little bit of a smoother transition uh, this takes a while uh, so I'm just going to show you with with two frames but you know ideally you'd want to do um, 10 or more frames for this step and so you can see here what it does, where it basically just overlays those. And so that's why, you know, obviously, in this, this very quick, um, almost epilepsy-inducing animation that I have here, um, you know, it's not, very, it's not a very effective transition. But you can imagine that if you had if you had many of those tween frames that, you know, going between those would look, look a bit more natural over time. Well, all right. Thank you all for watching. Hopefully this was helpful, and uh, I'll take any questions right after we're finished.